Hi, I'm Ralph Squalacci. I'm a principal product manager at Azure Core Upstream. That's at Microsoft, and we're the Deus Labs team, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and we've been working with WebAssembly for many years now, it seems like, uh, probably just one, but it's really more like three or three or four years. And I've got about 10 minutes to talk about WebAssembly, Docker, Container D, and then Kubernetes before I can get to a bunch of demos. And then we can have a whole bunch of questions, or at least that's the theory about how this is going to work. Let's see what we can do. So the agenda is pretty straightforward, right? Why the heck do we want to use this stuff? And uh, how does Docker Desktop do the WebAssembly magic as opposed to the container magic? And how does that WebAssembly magic connect to Kubernetes? Now, if we do that, then we're going to run into some demos, which is where you get a show, where I get to show you the stuff, and that's the fun part usually. So why the heck do we want WebAssembly, right? WASM is WebAssembly. And the main point here is that we want features. That's it, nothing but features. The features are mainly cold start speed, pure speed. You can optimize the startup here down to nanoseconds, uh, but out of the box with these models and runtimes, you get very single digit microsecond cold starts. That's fantastic and almost impossible to achieve with container architecture, right? Um, mainly not due to any fault, but mainly due to the fact that there's a whole kernel, a whole operating system to start. The size is very, very small because you're not bringing a whole operating system. You're bringing really one function, one code path. It's a binary. And that makes a huge difference for not just speed, but also things like transport, storage, the whole ball of wax. There is a default security ease factor at play here as well. WebAssembly has a sandbox, and that sandbox is by default full deny access to outside functionality. That's the opposite approach to default security that the container ecosystem has, because in containers, you share the kernel of the operating system that you're running on. And we spent a whole bunch of time uh, with distributions, making sure that that's controllable from the outside. Uh, WebAssembly actually gives you that stance from the beginning. The host controls everything, and you get to opt in to any functionality, no matter how dialed in and controlled it might be. And that is a wonderful stance to start from. And in the world we exist in and that the world that's coming, that's going to be more and more critically important. There, finally, there's portability, radical portability of four dimensions. I usually talk about them this way. Uh, you have language and runtime and tooling portability. Uh, you have uh, the ability to ignore operating systems for the most part, including use operating systems that don't have containers on them, uh, real-time operating systems, and so forth. You have architecture uh, agnosticity, so you can not really worry about what architecture your node is, and that has cost effects, but it also has uh, locational effects. Right? You can run on little teeny chips somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and that's really useful. And then finally, it, those locational effects in a lot of ways help you bring compute to the data. There's now just so much more data than ever existed, and that's going to continue to increase. So you need to make the compute work with the data, not make the data work with the compute. And so those are the main feature sets that we're looking for when we talk about WebAssembly. But we also need to clarify that by talking about when you don't want it, right? So if you don't need super fast cold starts because you have a big long running process, right? Then WebAssembly on that feature, uh, in, that, in terms of that feature, doesn't make, a sense. It doesn't make sense for you. Or if you live in a huge public hyperscale cloud like Azure or like uh, DigitalOcean or Alibaba or something like that, right? You don't need anything but containers and Kubernetes there. It works great. Enjoy yourself. Have a great time because those teams and those engineers are helping all of the feature set that you really want, the security and the scalability and all that stuff. They do that work along with you, which is fantastic. Or if you need to X copy something and have an entire o operating system with you, right, uh, in order to have something run, that's what containers do. And WebAssembly doesn't do that. It's a binary right now. Yes, in the future, you can probably have a WebAssembly that has all of an operating system in it, but then you're going to end up losing a lot of what WebAssembly is really fantastic about. You might be able to do it in three or four years, but right now, no. And the same thing goes if you have long running, heavy scheduled processes, uh, heavy you know, scheduling process, orchestration processes, like web servers or scale out databases or something like this. 
those kinds of things uh, don't work well in WebAssembly right now. And for the very same reason, you don't have threads. You only have 32 uh, bits of uh, memory space, so that's four gigs. Um, here's the obligatory quote. Nobody should ever need more than four gigs, really. Um, I hope to be quoted uh, about that uh, in the future, uh, 10 years from now. So there are good reasons why you don't want to use it. So when do you want to use it? Again? Okay. To get even simpler, when you want to do something with native code that native code or containers don't do, a lot of that has to do with the portability. It has to do with the speed and stuff like that. Or, like, they don't do it at all. Like, you can't run containers in certain environments, for example. And if you need to run there, it's important. Your work is mostly new, maybe. Or it's absolutely worth it to obtain some of these features to do something brand new that is of such value that you will recompile and modify the code you already have. If you have fast-firing functions already, then WebAssembly just makes those amazingly better and more portable. Uh, that just full stop true, and so that's a great scenario there. Or if you already have expertise with WebAssembly tools, if you're running with WebAssembly in CDNs or in web browsers and so forth, you, maybe you can just take advantage of this, these, those same abilities and feature sets somewhere else. So that's really the, right now, these are the sweet spots for the technology. Now, how does Docker Desktop do all this magic? Well, it uses Containerd and a Containerd shim. And now, if you don't know a lot about Containerd, there's a couple of links here. You can look it up. It's well documented. Containerd is a CNCF project. And Docker Desktop's WASM feature hooks into this and uses a Containerd shim directly to enable WebAssembly alongside um, uh, containers. So if you want to look at the Docker Desktop command that runs it, you can do it very straightforwardly. Docker container run, and then use the runtime path, and uh, specify the shim, and of course the workload. And it'll just launch the shim that knows how to run WebAssembly, as opposed to the shim that uh, is supposed to the process that, excuse me, knows how to run containers. So that's fantastic. But let's get to some history too, because if some people are aware of what's going on in the ecosystem and others are not, so the shim that Docker Desktop uses is called RunWazi, uh, but it's a different from, uh, and it uses the code from the RunWazi that my team built. But my team built uh, uh, originally the shim with the run with the Wasm time runtime. We did that because we were thinking about Kubernetes and we wanted to enable pod semantics like containers, uh, networking, and storage. Uh, I wanted to inherit that from a standard kubelet. We wanted to be able to ignore, ignore completely the node architecture, and we wanted the WASM feature set, all the size, density, faster deploys, and all that stuff. Now, Docker and Second State were also in the ecosystem thinking about how they wanted to run, and they were looking at run WASI as a container D shim example. And so they forked uh, run WASI and second state put in the WASM edge runtime and then added OCI lifecycle hooks um, together so that Docker Desktop could do uh, the beta, the what was the alpha, the tech preview, and now just released the beta feature for WebAssembly, the one that we, we just talked about. So if you're thinking about that, you're thinking, okay, wait, fork is a four letter word with an F in front of it. Is that bad? And the answer is no. This is uh, what this is. This is a healthy uh, example of forking because RunWazi had the core idea and it had different features, and we'll talk about that. What you should see coming, part of which you already see uh, coming, RunWazi from Deus Labs is now part of the Containerd project at the CNCF. So that's the kind of formal RunWazi project um, there that runs, that is a Containerd shim that runs WebAssembly. Now, Second State and Docker are working with us to bring in the composable runtimes. You should be able to just use RunWazi, but select the runtime you want. And Docker and Second State wanted to use and enable features of run, a Wasm Edge that Wasm Time doesn't have. And there are other features like Whammer has features and Wasm 3 has features and other, Was0 has features and so forth that you might want to use. And so you should be able to specify one, one uh, shim and a runtime and get the feature set that you want to work with in, in uh, Docker Desktop and in Kubernetes. So we're doing that work up there. 
And then three, the um, item three, Microsoft, Docker, Second State, and other contributors, where I'm thinking about the Yuki maintainers, are thinking about how to bring in the remainder of the OCI feature specification. And that'll end up including things like OCI artifacts, which Docker Hub just uh, announced that it would have support for. And finally, Docker is thinking about how to enable the selection of shims in Docker Desktop. So there might be a default shim like RunWazi that is useful uh, generically, but there may be custom shims you might want to use, and Docker Desktop should enable you to do that. In the end, over the next three to six months, depending on our day jobs, you should be able to build, test, run WebAssembly containers in Docker Desktop and push to Docker Hub, for example, any OCI registry, and then deploy directly to Kubernetes, the very same app, the way, without even thinking about the fact that it's WebAssembly per se, uh, that would be the objective. And in fact, all of these streams are coming together. So how does that connect with Kubernetes? Because the original objective was in fact to connect with Kubernetes here. And it uses the ContainerD shims, and ContainerD is the hinge between the kubelet on the node and the process model uh, whether it's run C or whether it's a WebAssembly engine of any sort. So let's see how this works. We're going to use K3Ds and we're going to use the uh, container D run WASI shim. So this doesn't work running in Docker Desktop yet, but it will uh, hopefully soon. And uh, it uses two different application models that are based on WASM time instead of WASM edge or another runtime. So this is an example of the different functionality and dependencies of the runtimes. So we're also going to use K3Ds because it demonstrates that you can run this on a single node very, very easily, uh, as well as in hyperscale. But we're going to start with a single node. Now I'm going to set up the ContainerD demo in Kubernetes, right, using uh, K3Ds, right, from Rancher and Suse. And this is just Kubernetes in a container. And while it sets up, uh, the important part is to realize that this is the same shim that is in container D project. And when we get the chance to merge all the runtimes, it'll be the shim that you can use with almost any Kubernetes distribution, unless you want to do something really, really custom. Uh, it doesn't matter what runtime. So given that that's the case, we now have a cluster. By the way, this is mostly in real time here. Um, so first thing we need to do is inform Kubernetes that the shims and the binaries that the shims have are on the cluster. And so we do that by uh, telling it about the runtime class. We can then actually lay down a workload. In this case, the manifest has five versions of a slight Hello World application, five versions of Spin. Spin is from Fermion. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little later. But you notice they come up in like four seconds, so like they're already there. And yet what we're doing is we're waiting for, ironically, a real container, the traffic container to come in so that we can have uh, ingress functionality, right? And so we're gonna sit here and wait for that, uh, a real container while their actual WebAssembly workloads are already spun up. We got it, uh, so we start hitting it. And right here I've sped it up a little bit only because nobody wants to see me fail 37 times until I succeed. That means the container, the ingress, they're all registered, they're working and so forth. And so I can go ahead and clear the thing and show you that hello world is there for slight and hello world is there for spin, right? I got to type it correctly, but it's there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and tear everything down again. And you'll have this video you like just to see like the whole process of bringing it up and tearing it back down and it should work exactly the same way no matter where you are. Um, that's all well and good, but what I while that happens, I want to point out that this is a single node cluster. It's actually multiple nodes, but it's a single container cluster and can run anywhere, a phone, a car, an elevator, whatever you want. It's a very, very different environment than container clusters are. And now we're going to try it with Azure Kubernetes Service. But before we do that, I just want to chat very briefly about performance. Now, these are spin functions from Fermion that we used here. And I want to show you exactly how fast this is. These are just hello worlds. They're local because it's K3Ds, right? But you can see that we're averaging five microseconds per request here. And the fastest are down to two microseconds. This is extremely fast and it's got out of the box performance unoptimized on the laptop that I'm recording this demo on. 
The slight functions are, a sl uh, are in fact, slightly slower, but there's a reason we are using the file system to simulate a key value store. And even in this case, we are actually running at about 11 microseconds per request, um, just over one millisecond. But we're using extra functionality, which is why there's a speed difference there. Um, this is uh, incredible performance. So can we use the same application set in Azure Kubernetes WASI node pool preview? And the answer, of course, is yes. So let's have a look. So here we've migrated from using K3Ds to uh, using AKS. And you can see that here we've set up uh, two node pools, WASI pool one, which is an AMD64 architecture, and WASI pool two, which is an ARM64 architecture. And ARM nodes are much less expensive uh, in general. So one of the effects of having two, no two different architectures with a regular container voting app um, you can see that if we get, actually get scheduled accidentally to the um, uh, a, a ARM node, uh, we bonk, I can't find the image, it's not made in multi-architecture. I now have to go back and do a whole bunch of work. I either modify and add node selectors to my Helm chart, or I have to actually do multi-architecture builds and push two different images and so forth. So what if we do if we actually deploy the same application that we did on K3Ds, right? If we do that, very quickly you can see that they're just evenly distributed throughout the, the nodes. It doesn't matter to the application because it's WebAssembly. And so in this case, the container sort of nodeness, node relationship in terms of architecture just goes away. I can prove that here by going and finding WASI pool one, which is the node pool that's AMD64, and just deleting it out from underneath the cluster. Now, what happens if I do this? Let's watch. I haven't sped this part up at all. We're looking for the termination. There they are. The nodes are going poof. And Kubernetes has already redistributed the, the WebAssembly apps onto the arm. You can see it's WASI pool 2 all the way down the nodes. And the containers still failing. And WebAssemblies have been completely migrated all to arm, which is less expensive. And you didn't do anything at all. But let's have a little, a little more fun, shall we? Rainer Strobik uh, built a Fibonacci tree app on his YouTube channel uh, using Docker Desktop in its environment and walked through for about 25 minutes how it worked, uh, built a fermion spin uh, function that does Fibonacci trees, and pushed it to fermions cloud and also pushed it to AKS. And what I wanted to do was do the same thing we did with the AKS thing. I wanted to take Rainier's application and deploy it in Fermion Cloud and, and AKS, but deploy it across multiple nodes. So let's do that. So what I wanted to do with Rainier's module that he had just built in that YouTube video, I wanted to deploy it in a different way in AKS than he did. So let's go look at his Docker file, right? You can see it there. It's a scratch file with the spin module and the spin toml in it. And that's all the container is. And he pushed it to Docker Hub. But for my AKS cluster, what I'm going to do is create the same one I did last time. I'm going to use um, both AMD and ARM nodes in a mixed configuration. Just to demonstrate that it's not just my application. I can take Rainier's uh, application, just like it's a container because it's a module, it's shoved into Docker Hub, and I can deploy it here on AKS, and I actually don't have to care what nodes I have at all. They could be big nodes, they could be small nodes, they could be ARM. Um, if other architectures are coming, such as RISC-V and so forth, they should just work and so on. So you can see them lay out right there. And just to make sure we know the application is running, um, we go ahead and look for the uh, service IP. Oh, and there it came really fast. So let's grab it. Um, and we will get our hopes up for instant satisfaction here. Uh, usually it takes a little bit to kick in, but no, we get instant satisfaction. Okay, great. Now, what I wanted to do was compare this actually to the Fermion app. This is the same exact, exact app that Rainier built and deployed in Fermion. And so we can look at that and we can grab some of the depth, the depth uh, query string and modify it and we get a kind of a richer uh, bushier tree. And we should be able to grab that query string 
right there and drop it into uh, there we go into Kubernetes and we get the the bigger healthier tree as well and of course now we'll have a little fun we'll go ahead and kick it up a notch uh, this is a fractal and we hit the resource boundary for fermion now that's by design that's not a mistake uh, I've got the the free tiers going on there so uh, I could obviously buy more resources but with Kubernetes I've got you know as much resources as the the nodes will chew so we can go to a even bushier tree than we could. Uh, so having done that, the thing that I want to point out is that you can see that ARM, three ARM nodes are deployed in two AMD nodes. And it just doesn't care. We could torch the nodes like we did with the other demo easily, and it would just redeploy. So another thing I want you to see is just how small the container with the modules is, just like what we're going to show you now. So let's start by looking at our cluster. We have a WASM cluster. And we go and look at the pods. And this service has an order service, a receipt generation service. And they're all clusters, along with virtual customers. And what they're doing is creating receipts from the virtual customer orders. And these are the receipts in JSON being written to Azure storage blobs. So if we flip over to Azure storage blobs, again, this is just a multi-service container application, you can see that we're processing a whole bunch of JSON um, formatted receipts. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. What I want to do now is go ahead and get the deployments. You can see the three services. And we're going to delete the container-based receipt generation service and go ahead and we'll actually spell it correctly. And we're going to go ahead and add the same service back. But the implementation here is WebAssembly. And in fact, uh, this wasn't used with Docker Desktop, but you could have built this service with Docker Desktop, which is entirely the point. So here it's cre being created, and once it is, we can now go and refresh the, uh, the uh, application or run and refresh on the blobs, and you can see that we're pumping out more receipts, which is fantastic. But here's the most important part. If we go and let's look at the images, you can see that the WebAssembly module is actually only 2.9 megabytes. Whereas the container it replaced is 210. That's something else. So that's it for the demo fun that we have. So that's it for the demo fun that we have. And I hope they all showed you various aspects of benefits and features that you could obtain using Docker Desktop and Kubernetes with WebAssembly, no matter how you're doing it. And you can see some of the future that we're going to, uh, as we unify all of these things into one nice, workflow. Uh, but I do want to call out a few things. I want to thank Docker for the desktop with WASM support and to them and Second State for the run WASI work that they did that will move upstream. I also want to call out and send some love to Rainier Stropik for the, his video tour. Go and have a watch. And if you're interested in everything, if we've done the job right, then do these things too when you have time. If you haven't, install and play with Docker desktop and enable the WASM support. Dork around with Fermion Spin and Spider Lightning from Deus Labs apps and build scratch containers for them with Docker Desktop. Push them to Docker Hub and deploy to K3Ds. Or create a cluster in Azure Kubernetes service and add a WASI node pool to deploy it there. But above all, have a blast doing these things because this is the fun part of technology. Thanks very much.